I'm not a solutionist. I'm going to stick my naughty fly uh, in the well-intentioned, beautiful ointment of this evening and say I'm not a solutionist. And actually talking about fixing and solving climate change, I think, is part of the problem. You can try and fix your bike or you can solve a crossword. Climate change is a bit more complicated than that because climate change is not like the ozone layer. It's not caused by one thing in one place which can be easily fixed by one international protocol. It's not a war because we're all on multiple sides at the same time. And if it's a war, it's a war on ourselves. And it's not like an asteroid coming at us from outer space like some terrible, unforeseen accident. It's something which has a deep history, has vested interests and a grim predictability. Because climate change is not a problem to be fixed or solved. It's a predicament. It's something we're going to have to work our way through. And it's also not like previous active social movements. It's not like civil rights or the suffragettes, where actually that was about the self-liberation of oppressed groups. Because climate change requires us to be selfless, and it requires us to care and connect for other lives, both human and non-human, who are often voiceless and cannot defend themselves. Because climate change is not an inconvenient glitch in the system. It's actually a symptom of something which has gone very profoundly wrong in our sense of relationship, which is a worldview of atomization, individualism, extractivism, industrialism, colonialism, and exploitation, of power over one another and power over nature. And that is a profound failure of relationship, both with ourselves and with the wider planet. And I would say it's an abusive relationship. And we need to look at the, ourselves in the mirror, as my future nought colleague Mark Stevenson says, depending on what we see in that reflection, is it Narcissus, a chronic self-love, or is it catharsis, something where we are confronted with our own responsibilities and galvanized into action? And many of you might have done a sort of deep eye contact exercise with another person where you stare into each other's eyes for, for three or four minutes. And that's an incredibly powerful experience. And what I would urge us all to do is to do what Joanna Macy says, hold the gaze, hold the gaze. Like Greta Thunberg with her autistic spectrum gifts, we cannot look away from this challenge. And we have to look at it very honestly because if not, we're just gaslighting ourselves. Because right now there is a huge honesty gap. You know, you will hear your political leaders talking about the sunlit uplands of painless transitions without a hair shirt in sight. But to keep 1.5 degrees alive, and let's face it, it's pretty much uh, in desperate resuscitation right now, we still have a hypothetical chance of getting there, but politically and technically, it's going to be incredibly difficult. So I think we're going to live through this era. You know, we're not going to fix or solve climate change. We're going to have to transformatively adapt to it. It's going to be an intergenerational challenge that our children, our grandchildren, and probably our great grandchildren will have to engage with. And that requires us to think about the biggest we, not just ourselves as individuals with our own behavior changes, but also pulling at every systemic lever we have at our disposal at the same time. When you actually engage with this challenge, as I have for over half my working life, 25 years now, it's normal to feel a whole suite of emotions, rage, anger, guilt, despair, frustration, anxiety, and grief. And that's all normal. But what we mustn't do is deploy our own psychological defenses to engage in a form of psychic numbing because everyone projects onto climate change. It's such a big issue. On one side, you have the projected hope, the techno utopian optimists with their messianic fervor who will tell you that just one more push of that brittle one dimensional optimism will get us over the line. On the other side, you have the projected hopelessness the resigned fatalism and nihilism, the misanthropy. But those are two opposing cliffs of projection. And in the middle, balancing on a precarious tightrope is where we have to balance with a bit of humor, 
humility and hyper self-reflectivity to keep asking ourselves the most difficult of questions because the weather inside, how we handle our own emotional reactions to this is going to be absolutely critical as things get both better and worse at the same time in the coming years. Because you don't fix or solve a broken relationship. You reinvent it, you reimagine it, you refresh it, you revitalize it. You put the life back into it. You literally breathe the life back into a relationship. Because solutions in that sense are just a distraction. It's a bit like saying to the lone woman on the streets of London late at night when approached by a single police officer that she should flag down a bus. It's a bit like putting drink, or cut lids on drinks in nightclubs to prevent spiking. They are tactics which are masking a toxic cultural problem underneath. And if we don't start asking the right questions, then we will end up with things like electric vehicles clogging our streets in the same way that cars do now, and we'll just have clean, quiet traffic jams. Because our breathless impatience on this, which is understandable, tells us that we don't have time for moral awakenings or moral imaginings. And we rush headlong towards these low carbon technical solutions. But without those moral awakenings and moral imaginings, we're just gonna repeat the same mistakes over and over again. And that's what leads to this edge of space willy waving that's going on at the moment, where we look to Mars with one covetous flirtatious wink, uh, like serial planetary monogamists, um, having dumped a broken relationship here back on Earth. And I think we need to use the most powerful human emotion, which is shame. And shame is a really difficult emotion. We are all incredibly hardwired to reject and avoid shame because it's painful. But without the shame, in the absence of shame, I think it's insulting in the context of everything we have already lost, are losing and will lose. But perhaps most importantly, engaging with that shame might help us to transcend and be genuinely proud of what we do next together. Because the planet, our gorgeous planet, doesn't want to be fixed. It doesn't want to be solved. It doesn't want to be saved. It doesn't want to be changed even. It wants to be loved. And when we truly love something and love ourselves, then we will do everything in our power and abilities and capacities to protect, nurture, and nourish it. Because I feel that fixing and solving are the foot soldiers of certainty and authoritarianism. There are a dark cloud over a sort of resurgent populist nationalism that could impose things on us because they are justified in supposedly needing to be done. What we need is the magic of the not yet imaginable. That's where the real power lies because great relationships involve listening and reflecting, challenging and confronting, but also healing together. This is an extraordinary ecological and climate emergency and it requires us to invoke an extraordinary emergence in ourselves, to rediscover that relationship of interdependence and interconnectedness of one people amongst an indivisible, inextricable family of life on one beautiful, only, lonely planet. And that is the relationship that must be restored. Because if we can embrace that relationship in these very difficult and uncertain times, then the path that is as yet untrodden may yet appear beneath our feet. Thank you for listening.